Hi everyone, I'm Colomb and this is Andrea. Say hello. Hello. <laughs> and we are the hosts of How to Build a Country. Today is season zero, episode three, How to Build a Global Country. Yes, we can. Positivity. We need positivity in this planet. Exactly. So basically, we'll show you that it's been done already. We're not saying something completely out of the box. Until recently, I thought it was a bit insane. And then when we started deep diving into history, I was like, actually, it was done 2,000 years ago. Yeah. We'll tell you how to a different scale, but it was done. So with the modern tech we have, with all of the capacity we have, it can definitely be done. So in today's episode of How to Go the Country, you can expect to hear about the Lycian League from 2,000 years ago, about the success of the African Union, about the failures of the UN, about the need for reform of the EU, I can't hold my fingers properly this way. <laughs> and why all of this means that we actually need to build a democratic system of global governance, a global country. And at Atlas, we are trying to build a democratic global governance. A global country. A basically a global country. Why? Because we believe there is the best solution to a lot of the problems that we're experiencing today. From climate change, to the risk of nuclear wars, to the fact there are massive inequalities across the planet. This is due to the fact that we do not have, do not have a way to come together as a human race and solve our problems. So we actually want to build it. It's a very, very ambitious goal, but we are running consultation next year across the planet to understand from people over the planet how we could do that, how we should design the system. And then we're going to run a massive campaign in front of the United Nations to try to change what we have and to make it better. And if we fail, and we feel, we feel we're going to fail because the United Nations, as you're going to hear soon, is very undemocratic. If we fail, we're going to build it ourselves, as citizens, because no one has said that we cannot build a democratic global country from, from scratch. So as Andrea said, it's ambitious. But is it that ambitious? That is the question. I believe that if you look at history, you can find a lot of examples of humans actually going beyond borders, going beyond city lines, going beyond country lines, uniting for the common good. And let me tell you a story. <laughs> <laughs> it's the whole week that she's obsessed by this story. So the summer I was in Turkey, visiting Turkey, and I stumbled into ruins. I came across the old parliament of the Lycian League. And the Lycian League was a league of cities 2000 years ago in the first century before Christ. So 23 cities came together and decided to have a joint parliament, to basically create a representative democratic federation in order to be able to fight against their oppressors and to stand a chance. So 23 cities came together where male citizens and residents of the cities could elect their representative proportionally according to the size of the city. And those representatives were, were responsible for financial, trade, economic, religious and legal matters of the Lycian life. So this, this joint parliament for 23 cities had competences over key aspects of city lives. So if you remove the gender sexist part, it's actually better than what we have today in many sense. Exactly. And this was the first known democratic federation in history. It's huge. It's huge. I don't understand why we don't know more about it. <laughs> because it's actually really impressive that more than 2000 years ago, people were like, well, obviously there's strength in unity. And actually, if you translate from the Lycian language, Lycian League, it means standing together. That's a which very, says very it all. Very name, very tiny name. Stronger than the United Nations, if you think about it. Exactly. So I love this example, and I just love it because at the beginning of the week, I was told, what you're doing is too forward looking, it will never work, it will create issues, na 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 na. One, don't tell me it will never work, it hasn't been tried, and we don't have solutions to global challenges yet, so it's a solution worth exploring, propose something better, or don't speak. Um, <laughs> And second, it has been done, not at the same level, but 2,000 years ago. We've had the same tech we have today and so on. It has been done. We can come together be beyond our differences and actually unite for the common good. And to be honest, we also have a very beautiful example in modern times. If you think about the European Union that now is taken as a given, as, as granted, I mean, it was created after the Second World War where countries of Europe massacred each other, million people died. And still we understood as a continent that there was a solution. It was better to come together than to stay apart. And today the European Union is the most successful and most powerful supranational organization of all. And I'm not saying in terms of budget or in terms of influence, influence across the planet, but it's the one that really managed to pull competencies out of member states and bring it in together. 
Today, the European Union has competencies on border control. It has a Supreme Court. It decides trade uh, policies. And this means that member states give their powers to this central union, which is very beautiful because it means that beyond national barriers, beyond languages, beyond cultures, they manage to come together and understand that there is strength in unity. This means that there is light at the end of the tunnel. We can make it. So there are some clear successes out of countries coming together and deciding to work together. For one, out of the United Nations, because we love to spend our time explaining all of the shortcomings of current intergovernmental organizations, UNICEF, which is a branch of the United Nations, managed to help save 90 million children since 1990. It's a massive. 90 million again. Just for this, it's a massive success. By coming together, by pooling resources, 90 million children were saved. Let me give you another example of the UN successes that is way more practical. You've all seen the Giza pyramid, right? In Egypt, the famous pyramid. <laughs> Not the pyramid, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever, <laughs> you understand. So UNESCO, which is another branch of the UN, managed to save it when the Egyptian government wanted to create a highway that was putting at risk the integrity of the structure. And UNESCO managed, because it's a World Heritage Site, to convince the government to divert it. And we still have this beautiful and important heritage. So the UN, by, by putting its symbolic weight behind certain battles, it has a positive, concrete impact. And the United Nations is not even the most integrated organization. As we said, the European Union is way more integrated. So the United Nations has a lot of shortcomings, but still, it managed to just these two massive achievements that Colomb mentioned came from the fact that this organization exists. Do you have any other example, Colomb? The African Union. I Go knew that it. you were going there. So we also have the African Union. There is a way younger organization, only 20 years old. It launched massive projects. For example, in 2021, it created an a, a all-encompassing free trade area uh, over Africa that includes more than 1.3 billion people. It's the largest one in the world. The largest one in the world. That, if successful, is going to pull more than 30 million people out of poverty, out of extreme poverty. These are massive numbers. So you can see, really, strength comes with unity. Exactly. So it's possible to create a global country that is democratic. The Lichten League showed it 2,000 years ago. The European Union shows at a continental level what deep social, political and economic integration does. The African Union shows the potential of creating free trade areas, of going beyond borders. So we know there's hope. We also know that it needs to be improved. Because for a global country, a global federation to work, for it to stand a chance at solving climate change, at making sure that Amazon pays its taxes, at ensuring that rights are respected across the world, at ensuring that when we end up going to space, it doesn't belong to a few billionaires or two countries, but that us, the people, have a say. To do this, we need to ensure that our global country is truly democratic, that we go beyond national interests, and that it is accountable and transparent. And why are we saying this? We're saying this because today, it's not the case with what we have. So let's start from the beginning. Let's start with democracy. Obviously, we want a democratic system of global governance. But what we have right now is not democratic. Let's take the United Nations, the most famous example. I mean, the United Nations is supposed to bring the peoples of the world together. But actually, none of us have a vote or a direct say in what's going on at the United Nations. There's not even a way to file a petition, a referendum. We're completely excluded as citizens. And I think for, for me, the most clear example of this is in the veto power that some countries have in the United Nations. So no one would consider that in a normal democracy, a few people should be able to veto decisions or whatever they don't like. That's not democracy, that's kindergarten. But this is exactly what happens in the United Nations where five nations, the five winners of the Second World War and also five nuclear power, China, the US, France, the United Kingdom and Russia, have a veto power at the Security Council, the highest body of the organization. Which means if they are not happy with something, they stop it. And this power is actually used very often. I have some numbers here. Until July 2019, so in the first 70 years of the organization life, Russia vetoed 141 resolutions. The United States, 83, and so on and so forth. So actually, it's a massive amount of decisions, which completely paralyzed the work of the United Nations. This is something we must overcome. 
And if you look at it overall, so there's the issue with veto. It's insane. Five countries decide over the rest of the world, over more than 190 countries. It's completely undemocratic. But then again, in any intergovernmental organization that represents citizens, it should represent citizens. It should be democratic. We should have a way of voting for the UN Secretary General, right? The chief of the UN. We should have a parliament. But then you consider that the UN is made up of democratic and extremely authoritarian countries that will never allow for this. It cannot work. The people of the world are not represented. And we see it very concretely today with, for example, the climate uh, crisis. Right now, COP27 is happening. And we see that if citizens were to vote on how to solve climate issues, I'm pretty sure it would go much, much better. And experiments have been done on this. Then with countries that are not directly representing the common good, but that are only representing themselves. And this leads to the second point, exactly. right? To national interests always coming before global interests. But let's stop picking on the United Nations for, <laughs> for, for a minute. We talked about the EU as the most integrated body or international organization in the world. Yet the EU is often the perfect example of national interests coming first, despite the fact that there's more integration than in other organizations. We talked about the veto of the Security Council. There's something very similar yeah. in the European Union, which is the European Council. So in the European Union, you have a cool thing, which is the European Parliament, where citizens vote for their representatives, although the Parliament cannot initiate laws, which is extremely weird, in my opinion. Then you have an executive, the Commission, that we don't vote for. And then finally, we have the European Council. There's other bodies. I'm oversimplifying it. The European Council is where the heads of states sit together. So on a certain number of issues that are sensitive, like common foreign policy, security policy, EU membership, harmonization of national legislation, indirect taxation, EU finances, and many more core topics, any country can basically veto a law, or all countries have to agree. Try to agree with 27 people. It's impossible. I can't agree with two people. <laughs> 27, it's impossible, especially on the main issues of our time. I think in one of the lives I compared it with the fact that if I discuss with my friends what is the best chocolate, milk, dark or white, we won't get there. We won't get there. <laughs> so try to agree on finances with 27 people all have to agree unanimously. It does not happen because they have the national interests at the heart. They represent, heads of state represent their own constituencies, yeah. not the common EU interests. And I think this practically translates in a lot of shortcomings for the organization. Let's take one example. I remember during COVID times, I'm Italian, so if you look at Europe, it, <laughs> I'm clearly Italian. If you look at Europe, it's the first country that was affected by COVID in a big scale. And I fully remember how each country in the first month of the pandemic looked only at itself. There was no common strategy, no sharing of resources, no support. Uh, each country was closing its border, hoarding PPE and other equipment to face the pandemic, which again, it's understandable because they were referring to their own national constituencies and, uh, and public, but where is the European Union when there is a crisis? Yeah. So it shows that whenever shit hits the fan, actually um, everyone forgets about Europe and feel only about their countries. So we basically said so far, for a global country to work, we need democracy. It needs to have the legitimacy that comes through popular votes and so on. But we also need to have a global interest, not just national interest first. And it goes hand in hand with democracy, because if you only have nation states represented in global organizations, it doesn't work. They answer to the direct electorate. They think about the national interest before the common good. We see it with climate. Every country is trying to downgrade their commitment instead of stepping it up for everyone. They're hoping that others will do more than them without doing their part. So it goes hand in hand with having a system, a representation of citizens of the world, creating a higher level of belonging. And the last part is accountability and transparency, which is fundamental for trust and legitimacy again. Yeah, also here we took an example, there are plenty of things that do not work in supranational organization, but we took a different regional, regional example, the African Union. There was a report done um, in 2019, I think or 2020, basically analyzing the level of corruption within the organization. And it shows that actually, it basically works as a nepotist autocratic organization. 70% of the staff of the African Union is on a short-term contract, which is highly likely to be negotiated and given based on personal relationship, which means that you know, the, the African Union was set up also to support the transition out of corruption in certain states, supporting transparency and so on, and then is victim of the same lack of transparency and accountability 
that many other organizations are suffering from, which means that we need direct public scrutiny and public election and democratic participation brings exactly that. So here we are. History shows that it is possible to build a global democratic federation. 2,000 years ago, people came together beyond their cities to do so. Today, people come together beyond their countries to do so. And we now need to do it again. After the Second World War, the League of Nations, which was the ancestor of the United Nations, died, basically. It was turned into the United Nations. Robert Cecil, one of the fathers of the League of Nations, in his final speech in the final convening of the League of Nations said, the League is dead, long live the United Nations. Today, we see that the United Nations, because of the lack of democracy, the fact that national interests always come first, and the lack of accountability and transparency, is no longer fit for purpose to govern us all. So the United Nations are dying. What are we saying long live to? We believe it should be to a global democratic system of governance, to a global country or a global federation. What do you think? Do you think that this is a good idea? What are some of the other examples that you've come across? Send it to us, but not only. We live in a time right now where we can't afford to just wait behind, watch a YouTube video, hopefully comment, like, share with family. (laughs) We need to do more than this. When you consider Russia and Ukraine, when you consider crackdowns in Hong Kong, in Venezuela, all around the world, when you consider the fact that the floods in Nigeria were 80 times more likely because of climate change. When you consider the multitude of global challenges, it is clear that we need to act. We are trying. We're not saying it's the one solution. We're not saying it will work. Most likely, anything will fail. We think we're trying our best. At last, the movement, as of of the 1st of January 2023, is launching global consultation to crowdsource what a global democratic governance should look like, because it's not 11 men in a room that are going to decide this time. It's us, the people. And then we'll create campaigns on it. We'll put pressure. We'll build it ourselves if needed. We are trying and taking the future into our hands. Because what other choice do we have? So please, please join us. Support this project. And if you have some time to spare, join our team. We need volunteers. We need heroes. And I think it's going to be a beautiful ride. Thank you so much for following this podcast. As Claude mentioned, like, share, comment. And see you next week.